Thank you for coming today to my talk about GRUN, so public verifiable randomness explain. So I'm Yalan, so this is a disclaimer for our American friends. I'm from Switzerland, not Sweden, so it's not the same thing. We got the chocolate and the cheese, they got IKEA and I don't know, a lot of snow. Um, I'm a CTF player, uh, I'm an applied cryptographer at Protocol Labs, so not to be mixed with a Web3 developer, so please don't come after me. Um, and yeah, I got a math background, but I will try to make these, you know, as simple as possible. It's about computer sciences and like computer engineering, not about math today. So what are we going to see? Well, we're going to see what is randomness. And then we will see what kind of flavors we have for randomness, what are the different kinds of randomness that we have. Finally, we'll, well, next we'll see why we need randomness, um, what kind of problems there are with randomness, and how to do it properly in practice. So, what is randomness? It's a good question, right? So we can look it up. According to the Cambridge Dictionary, Randomness is the quality of being random. Great! That's it, right? Well, granted, they refine it a bit. So, it's a quality of being random, which means happening, done, or chosen by chance, rather than according to a plan. Um, if you look at other dictionaries, you can see maybe better definitions, such as According to the Oxford language definition, it's the quality or state of lacking a pattern. And that notion of lacking a pattern is super important for randomness, and we'll see why in a minute. So here are five, uh, yeah, five random strings. Does, does the first one look random? Yeah, super random. Does the second one look random? Well, the second one is actually random. How about the third one? Not random, obviously not. So next, we got the, the fourth one, which looks fairly random, right? Unless you look at it in hexadecimal. That doesn't look random then anymore. And finally, the last one has an obvious pattern, so it doesn't look random neither. So, the important thing to remember with randomness is that all of these values had the same probability of occurring at random if you were to pick a random number of that size. So it's really difficult to say if something is random or not. Um, we can try to do that. We can have some intuition of what is random by looking whether there are patterns or not. And there is a more formal academic treatment of randomness that is called like the Kolmogor of complexity, which is basically the notion that if you can compress it, if you can, you know, output it in a smaller form factor, then maybe it's not so random. So typically, uh, here I can represent the first line with just 19 characters instead of the 48 characters I needed to, to display it in full. So, it doesn't really look random according to Kolmogor of complexity neither. But today is not a talk about Kolmogor of complexity. It's not a lecture, you know, so we will get into what is randomness and its different kind of flavors now. So first, I want to talk about the notion of public randomness. So public randomness is the notion that you want to pick a random number and reveal it to everybody. It's going to be public, you know, like you will publish it on your website or maybe you're running a lottery and you're drawing the um, numbers live on TV, but it's going to be public, okay? That's a different notion of randomness than the one we're most used to, which is that of secret randomness. We 
very often use randomness to generate secret keys. Whenever you connect to a website nowadays, you're using TLS, or at least you should. And TLS is using ephemeral keys. An ephemeral key is a random secret value that is drawn from your computer and it should be random to ensure your security, well, to ensure the privacy of your uh, communication channels. Um, we typically use secret randomness for generating secret keys. Your PGP key must should be random. Your Bitcoin private key should be random, and so on. It's very important to never use public randomness as a source of randomness to generate secret values. So please do not use a public random value to generate your next PGP key. It would be easily broken. Next, I want to talk about the notion of verifiable randomness. And that's something we don't see too often, but it's really important with public randomness because they combine together really well. So verifiable randomness is basically a random value that you can verify it had been generated properly. So if you can verify the random value is actually random, then maybe you can trust it more. And that's really interesting for a different, for many use cases. Uh, we'll see use cases soon. So another big problem with randomness is the notion of distributed randomness. So nowadays, the internet is becoming more and more decentralized. And there is this notion of web three where everything should be more and more decentralized and distributed. And Agreeing on a random value as a group, so having consensus on a random value is really difficult if you want to ensure it's unpredictable, for example, because if you can not predict it, how can you be sure everybody's going to come up with the same random value, right? So achieving consensus on random values is difficult, and you can look at blockchain, for example, like Ethereum and that kind of, you know, blockchain that are running smart contracts. If you want to run a lottery on Ethereum, it's going to be difficult because it is fairly easy to predict future values. And there is a huge problem in the space currently with the MEV. So, you know, it's when miners can extract more value out of a block than just the reward from the transaction fees and the, the classic, the normal reward. And that kind of things are difficult. So I gave you some hints of why we need randomness already, but I'm going to go over a few more use cases now. So public randomness make a lot of sense for lotteries, jury election, uh, audits, random sampling, and that kind of things. It's the secret randomness is really used and very important for all cryptographic protocols out there. Uh, from TLS to SSH, you're probably using secret values, secret random values daily. Um, next, we have a few more use cases that might be less obvious, such as sampling. If you are running a medical study and you need to sample people at random, what do you do to make sure it's random and somebody didn't select their friends or something like that? It becomes even more interesting if you're looking into use cases where people are introducing, for example, a basic income in a country and they need to select people at random because corruption and that kind of things are still a thing nowadays. And if you cannot do random selection properly, if you can bias it, then it's really bad. So a very good example of that is um, like, a, like a month ago, even, yeah, even less than a month ago, a few days back, um, we could see that both the former FBI director and his deputy were selected at random by the IRS for an intensive audit. That's an exact but that's a really good example of why we need public verifiable randomness. Because now nobody's going to trust the IRS is actually selecting people at random, right? Next, we'll see why there are problems with randomness. So 
it's somebody, it, it's something cryptographers will say very often. Randomness is hard. And trust me, I've been doing a lot of code audits where I was looking at other people's codes and the most common flow was usually, usually randomness. People will introduce bias or make the randomness predictable in ways that would break their whole systems. And these are the two very important properties we usually want to have with secret randomness or even proper randomness in general. We want it to be unpredictable and we want it to be bias resistant. So why do we want it to be unpredictable? Because if you can predict a random value, you can most likely cheat or do something bad. If it's a lottery, you could predict the winning ticket and win it. If it's in a game or if it's in um, an audit, you could warn people or do nefarious things. So we really want it to be unpredictable. For cryptographic protocols, it's even more important because if you can predict the randomness in a ECDSA, for example, you can actually do a full secret key extraction. And that is the worst thing that can happen to a cryptographic protocol. Secret key extraction is something you don't want to, to have, right? And why unbiased? Well, this is trickier because having a bias is not always a bad thing. Uh, maybe you want to select more people in your study that are between 20 and 30 years old or whatsoever. It depends what you're doing with your randomness. But for cryptographic purposes, for secret randomness, you really, really want it to be unbiased because just a one-bit bias can also leak your secret key if you've been signing enough um, things, be it transactions, be it emails, whatever you're doing with your private key, if you sign enough messages and you have a bias in your number, in your random number generation, we can extract your private key. And that's the worst thing that can happen, right? And that's true for all cryptographic schemes that are most used nowadays. So it's not necessarily true for RSA, but RSA has been phased out nowadays and we're using Schnorr-like signatures such as ECDSA, EDDSA, Elgamal, Schnorr, BLS, and so on. And these are very sensitive to bias randomness. So maybe you've been coding already and maybe you needed to draw a random value. How would you do that? Well, a very easy way to draw a random value is just to call your operating system random get random um, syscall, right? So most programming languages offer such um, calls through uh, OS or whatsoever module. So here is an example. To get a random number between 0 and 255, we can just draw a random byte and convert it into a number. That's fine, it's unbiased, it's good randomness if you've got a modern computer, nothing to worry about. But if you don't want to pick a random value between 0 and 255, say you want to pick a random value between 0 and 106, so you have 107 possibilities from 0 to 106, how would you do that? Well, most people will think, ah, I just reduce it modulo 107, right? That's a very easy way to just slash the extra um, values you could have gotten in your bytes. But that's actually not a good idea at all because this is called modulo bias. And here is a graph of why modulo bias is bad. So if you do that, your lower values will have a higher chance of being drawn. So here in this example, uh, we're drawing one byte. So we have 256 possibilities and we are converting it into a number that's smaller to 107. And that means we have the 42 lower values from zero to 41 that are more likely to occur. And this means you've just leaked your private key if you were doing a cryptographic protocol or something like that. So it's really important not to reduce modulo 
um, the, the target value if you're doing secret stuff with your randomness. The best way to avoid bias is just to rely on your cryptographic PRNG to give you proper values. So most libraries from Python to Go to Rust, you can even find some in C, but who's coding in C, right? Um, all of these languages have standard libraries that provide you with good randomness, good random numbers that are unbiased and easy to sample. You can, you can also read my blog post about how to avoid modulo bias. Uh, it's the link here. I'll post the slides on my website. I guess MCH also posting the slides online, so it should be fairly easy to find if you want to, to read more about modulo bias. Um, last time I talked about that, somebody asked, hey, what if I just divide by 255 and multiply by the value I want to get? That's unbiased, right? Well, no, because precision and floating points number are going to kill you again. So this is not going to be biased like the modulo bias. So you won't see a heavy first half of the graph, you know, but you will get spike in the middle of your graph. Um, and that's also terrible. Uh, there is a really good blog post by the PCG random team, uh, which are really go going into the details of how oh, uh, PRNG and randomness works. Uh, highly recommended if you want to learn more about not using floating points. So in practice now. So in practice, randomness has been really difficult for a long time, but we've mostly solved it on personal computers. The somewhat unsolved thing was public verifiable randomness. So that was first proposed in 1993 by Rabin. Um, the notion that having a trusted intermediary could release like trusted random public run, run, random numbers uh, was introduced, but eh, you need to trust somebody who wants to do that, right? So there are websites that offer public randomness. For example, random.org claims to be using a true random generator or collecting the atmospheric noise and giving you random values. But how do you trust them? It's just a website. You can't really look into their system. It's not open source. It's super annoying, too. So, ah. Next, you have NIST. You know the NIST? Um, standardization body in the US. Uh, they're very active in the cybersecurity space and for cryptographic protocols and everything. And so they released the first public, verifiable, trusted randomness beacon in 2013. But NIST is also very famous for trying to bias randomness with their dual ECB random generator. So who would trust NIST to run a public randomness service, right? So there have been a lot of previous attempts at doing public randomness right. And uh, one of them was an academic word, work, run, hound, and it seemed like a really good way to achieve this. Sadly, it was using Schnorr signatures, it was relatively slow, had a lot of uh, network overhead. And so the question was, can we do it in a simpler and faster way? Um, the answer, actually, is yes. So just like we have NTP servers, DNS servers, um, certificate transparency servers and that kind of things, we were thinking the internet really needed a public verifiable randomness protocol that anybody could use. And that's exactly what DRAND is about. DRAND is an open source software. It's coded in Go. Uh, it's coming originally from EPFL, so it's been studied uh, by academics. And then it was um, launched later by Many people will see that later. But DRAN is relying on cool threshold cryptography, and it's providing the nice thing we want with public verifiable randomness. So we'll get into the details now. DRAN is meant to be decentralized. So DRAN is just the software, and you can run it on multiple nodes. And when you run it on multiple nodes, they connect to each other to form a, a network. And that network is using threshold cryptography, which means you need, just need a threshold number of nodes to be available for it to produce randomness. Um, that randomness is going to be unpredictable, bias resistant, unverifiable. So it's really good public randomness. 
Um, the randomness is currently chained, so each new beacon is linked to the previous beacon. So if you don't know the previous beacon, you can generate the next beacon. So it's really it's helping with the unpredictability. And as long as you even compromise the threshold number of nodes, you are guaranteed you cannot predict the next round. It's really easy to use. This is the JavaScript code to verify uh, DRAN randomness. So you can see it's very few uh, line of codes. You just need to import the BLS 12, uh, 381 uh, code from a uh, novel uh, library, and then it's very easy to verify. Um, the threat model behind DRAN is basically that of a threshold network. So you have a set of nodes, and together, they are going to generate randomness every 30 seconds. And they do that by relying on BLS signatures. BLS is a threshold signature scheme, and you just require, for example, currently 13 members to generate a valid signature to get a group signature. And that signature is valid under the whole group public key, and that group public key allows you to verify randomness was generated properly. The security of BLS and that kind of threshold cryptography is fairly good, as long as you don't get a quantum computer. So we should be fine for the next five to 20 years, I guess. Also, it's very important your secret key stay secret and so on, but we'll see that uh, in a minute. Diran is also exposing public APIs, so you can just query it online. It's a REST API. You can curl it. You can use it in your browser. Um, and you get the randomness and the signature, which allows you to verify the randomness was generated properly. Um, while Diran is just a software and is you know, exposing endpoints and everything, you can't really use it unless you have a network, right? So that's where the League of Entropy comes in. The League of Entropy is a set of companies, universities, and research teams that came together and decided to run a DRAN network to provide public verifiable randomness to anybody who needs it. It was first created in 2019 with 10 members. It has since grown to 16 members with 23 nodes on a threshold of 12. Um, I think we just ran um, in the last ceremony, we were now maybe 24 nodes on the threshold of 13. Uh, everything is open source, you can look it up, and um, it's, yeah, fairly interesting. The nice thing with DRAN is that all nodes can provide their own entropy during the distributed key generation. So, for example, here, Cloudflare is using their lava lamps as a source of entropy uh, in DRAND. So, it's true randomness, you know? And DRAND is collecting the randomness from all the members that run the uh, distributed key generation, and that means it also should be fairly solid in terms of unpredictability, and that's a nice, nice to have thing. DRAN has been running for, uh, well, the League of Entropy has been running DRAN for now two years. We just crossed two million rounds last week, and we had zero downtime. So it's a really good battle-tested system if you need public randomness. And what can we do with DRAN? Well, we can obviously do lotteries, we can do gambling, we can do a lot of things, but something I'm super excited about is time-lock encryption. And that's something we researched in the past six months, mostly. And to enable that, we needed to be able to run multiple networks on the same DRAN node. So we recently introduced the notion of multi-protocol support, which means a single node can run multiple networks. So we can have a post-quantum network, we can have a very fast network, we can have a very slow network. We can have also, instead of a chain randomness where each beacon is linked to the previous one by its signature, we could have an unchained network. And the really nice thing with unchained network is that you can predict the message that is going to be signed in two days or maybe in a week. 
And if you can predict that message, then you can use very fancy cryptography to do time-lock encryption. And this is something that's amazing, because time-lock encryption uh, is an unsolved problem since 1993 as well, when it was proposed on the cypherpunk mailing list by Tim May. And time-lock encryption is using pairing-based and identity-based crypto, just like we do with DRAND, and it means it's very easy to integrate with DRAND. So each DRAND round, I told you, um, is produced at, at a given time. So for example, we produce currently rounds every 30 seconds on the current network. Uh, we are probably going to launch a faster network, but the current network is staying, right? We can run multiple networks at once. And every 30 seconds, we get a round. So in five minutes, it's just 10 rounds in the future, right? So we can link different randomness and rounds and beacons to future time. And that means we can use time lock encryption to encrypt towards a future round. And that's a super cool thing. I'm not going to explain it because it's going to be released next month uh, at DEF CON, actually. So we'll be releasing time lock encryption based on DRAND. Um, you can use it for a lot of things, in including a dead man's full yet responsible disclosure system. Uh, we're going to release a, a time lock encryption open source library. We're going to release a JavaScript web app as well running in your browser. So uh, I'm super excited about that. Uh, finally, we would love you to use DRAN, right? So we created this cool public randomness server, and anybody can use it. You can verify it's random. You can use it in your, I don't know, lotteries, in your jury election to select people at random for your audits. Uh, you can use it in smart contracts and so on. So please don't hesitate to use DRAN. Currently, it's mostly used by Filecoin to do leader election. Uh, there is a company in the US that actually is using the run randomness in their gambling system to generate random values for their uh, gambling machines. Uh, it got authorized by the gambling uh, federation in the US, so it's pretty cool as well. And we got a website explaining everything about the run in case you are interested. And another cool thing you could be doing is decide to join the League of Entropy. So come and join Cloudflare, uh, Protocol Labs, and many other, the many other members of the League, and you could run a node. So if you're used to have high have availability servers or something like that, please come and talk to me. We would be thrilled to expand the League of Entropy because the more members we have, the higher the security and the trust in the network will be because of the fact that you just need to trust the threshold number of nodes. So as long as you're sure there are enough diversified members in the League of Entropy and that they are not going to collude together, you can trust the League of Entropy to produce fair and biased randomness. Um, um, that's it, more or less. So thank you for coming today. I'm. Thanks a lot. We have time left, and if there are any questions, please line up at the microphones in the middle of the room. Anyone? Yes. Front microphone, please. Step close so that we can hear you. Test, test. Yes, there we are. Thanks for the talk. Important uh, work, I think. Um, I was wondering, do you have ready-made scripts or yeah, programs to, um, how do I put this, for people to afterwards verify that things were indeed random and correct? Make it, make it easy for people to check this, actually. Yes. So. I didn't go into the math too much, but basically uh, the random values is generated from a signature, so from a, sig a BLS signature. And DRAND rounds are made of all the information you need to verify that signature. And you just need to use the public key of the network. So uh, if the signature that verifies under the public key of the network, then you can 
be sure it was properly generated by the network. And if the network is not malicious, then it's good. So you can do that by either querying the DRAN endpoints and getting the beacons, or you could, uh, in your application or whatsoever, uh, include the signature as well as the, as the randomness. So people can see they can derive the same randomness out of the signature. Um, to be more precise, we can't use the signature itself as a random value, but a signature must satisfy the indistinguishability under, um, between two um, signatures. So it's, it must be indistinguishable from random. Otherwise, it's not a secure signature scheme. The problem with signatures is that there are unfunny uh, elliptic curves, right? So if you if you just take the signature, you will get the algebraic structure of the, of the elliptic curve that's going to bias your randomness. So what we do is we take the signature, we hash it to map it to a uniform uh, random uh, string, and so that's how you can verify it was properly derived. You take the signature, you validate the signature, and then you hash it, and you get the same randomness, and that's it. Thank you. You're okay. welcome. And we have another question. So usually in things like this, there's an there's an input component. There's the keys, and then there's also an input component, like the input to a BLS, this message being signed in BLS signature or something. Um, is there a way to contribute not to the randomness of the keys, I guess, but to the randomness of the input so that you get a kind of a faster turnaround time in terms of knowing your contribution was included? Um, Without being a member, I mean. So. Currently, I didn't go into the details too much, but the um, only time where new entropy is contributed to the network is during key generation. So uh, the messages we are signing with the BLS signature scheme are the previous signature and the round number. Um, that is fine as long as we still satisfy the security assumption that the there is never a threshold number of malicious nodes. But so you can, un you can, you, yeah, you, we could add a way to make the signatures more uh, unpredictable by adding some random values to the uh, messages we are signing. Currently, it's not the case because it's difficult to agree, to achieve consensus on a random value to include in the messages. So currently, the only time you get new entropy is during key generation, yeah. Okay, are there any more questions? Or is everything clear and answered? Anyone? One more. Okay, front micro. Um, so you require simple majority of the um, parties um, to produce the random number. Can you scale that up to like a higher threshold if you want to be sure that he, uh, well, I guess this has like liveness uh, implications then? So the League of Entropy is doing resharings re regularly to refresh the shares because of the threshold cryptography thingy. So if um, we want to increase the size of the network, we can add new uh, nodes and change the threshold during the resharing. Yeah. Okay. So it's, it's possible. But you need a threshold number of nodes to agree to do a resharing. Right. But if you want to say... Um uh, if you grow this set to like a really large number, and then you, uh, if you want to reduce like the amount of trust that you have to like, um, right, if you start accepting like worse or like less trusted instances, and then you want to keep the threshold still high, um, uh, we, we, then you maybe want to increase the threshold, I suppose. Um, um, I, yeah, I suppose. So if we add more uh, members, and we wouldn't trust them to be able to be trustworthy. I mean, we don't trust any single member in the network currently, but if we, you know, had an easy way to get into the network, somebody could try and add a lot of malicious nodes so that they would get a threshold number of malicious nodes. So currently the network is really permission, so you need to get approval to get in, right? You can't just join the network like that. You need a threshold number of nodes to agree to onboard a new node. And so, yeah, definitely, if we were to increase the size to 100 or 200 uh, nodes, uh, we might want to increase the size of the threshold as well. But the thing is, currently, um, 
I, I had a slide about it actually. The, the network is trying to be fairly diversified. So we're trying to not be on a single continent. We're trying to not run on a single uh, cloud provider and so on. And in the future, we're also looking into impl having more implementations so that if there is a bug, uh, for example, in the Go implementation, we would still have maybe the, I don't know, the, the Rust and the Python implementation working. So, yeah, there are a lot, yeah, so you can, you can play with the threshold, but the larger the threshold is, the more dangerous it gets for liveness, because if AWS goes down, suddenly the network would stop, and that's something we really don't want to happen. We want it to be very, like, high availability and doing its work every 30 seconds, you know, so. Okay, and we have one more question. All right, thank you for, uh, for creating this wonderful tool, or toy. Um, if I sort of like look at this, uh, and I kind of like see really nice diversity uh, across quite a few continents, um, and, and sort of like types of organizations, on-premise, off-premise, and so on, cloud, um, and I think of like how you would use this, uh, you could almost, would it be fair to argue that if you sort of like add a few, let's say, Asian, South Africa, Australia, you are essentially done? Because is there a fundamental reason to, to go to a much larger number of, of nodes? So, so sorry, I'm not sure I'm getting the question. Well, so, so you're very far on your way already having a nice mix of clouds and on-premise. So yes. in, in, in a way, for, for a lot of like attack models, you're covered there. Um, you also got quite a few countries there, like add some Asia, add some Australia, and you've basically got the whole, whole world. Is there any fundamental technical or security reasons why you need more nodes than that? Like why it would be better to have 100 nodes than just, let's say, 30 and be finished with it? Um, really no technical reasons, mostly human reasons, I guess. Uh, do people trust Cloudflare? Do people trust Protocol Lab? Do people trust Ethereum Foundation? Uh, do you trust the EPFL uh, University in Switzerland? Do you trust the UCL in London? Um, so it depends, right? It depends on your threat model and that kind of thing. So having more nodes could increase the trust of some people in the network, but at the same time, it would be more difficult to keep up with the liveness. So currently, we're not planning to get to 100 or 200 nodes. The goal would be maybe to achieve more diversity, diversity a more diverse set of nodes, like adding um, yeah, Australia, adding Japan, and so on to the list would be great. Uh, a really nice thing as well with Zeron is since you just need a threshold number of nodes to communicate with each other to achieve, um, to get the final beacon. You could get um, nodes in America talking to each other, generating the exact same randomness than the nodes that are in Europa. So you don't get too impacted by the lag if you have uh, enough nodes, but that's a very interesting research project we're actually looking into right now. Uh, all the network and the lag is actually impacting us. Um, because with a, such a network running on a global scale, it can become somewhat of an issue. So currently, we have 800 milliseconds of lag on producing the next round, so we couldn't go below one second uh, with proper warranties of availability and liveness, right? But um, yeah, so it's pretty cool to have such a global network. And yeah. Okay. If there are no more questions, thank you very much again for awesome. the talk. <laughs>